Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Eric. I'm going to be preaching on Psalm 93 today. The first thing I want to mention, though, is that I'm disappointed because when I came into the church this morning, this is what I found. Now, I made a real offer that I was going to hide this in the church somewhere and the first person to find it could keep it. But apparently, none of you are that desperate yet. Well, the toilet paper is still here, and hopefully today is another good sermon. Today's sermon is titled, The More Things Change, The More God Stays the Same. The more things change, the more that God stays the same. In this present life, we know that we are exposed to constant change. Here's a picture of me in seventh grade. Well, I look a little different now. The back of the card says that uh, I was five feet, three inches tall and that I weighed 82 pounds. Well, I don't weigh 82 pounds anymore, and I am no longer five feet, three inches tall. I have changed. You know, a lot of you listening to this sermon, you can uh, head on up to the school cafeteria. You can see your picture on the wall, and you can see that you also have changed over time. In this present life, the reality is that everything is constantly changing, including us. The ancient philosopher Heraclitus declared, whatever is, is changing. For instance, he insisted that you cannot step into the same river twice. What he meant is that the water of a river is not stagnant, it's flowing. If we put one foot into the river, we know that by the time we put the other foot into the river, the river has changed. And not only has the river changed, but in that short amount of time, we have changed as well. So life is like a river. Forrest Gump said life is like a box of chocolates. Uh, Heraclitus said that life is like a river. We change and everything around us changes all the time. This is a graph of the stock market. This is a snapshot of the S&P 500 from March 9th to March 13th. What do we see here? We see a lot of change. Well, the stock market is like life. The stock market is never the same from one day to the next, and neither is life. And just like the coronavirus has wreaked havoc on the stock market, uh, it can feel at times, and there's actually a lot of truth to the idea that the coronavirus has wreaked havoc on our lives as well. Because of the coronavirus and because of the measures that we have put in place to combat it, we are experiencing more change than normal. Now, in the last video I uploaded, I talk about an important rule, the 10-80-10 rule that helps us to live faithfully in times of volatility. If you haven't seen that, I invite you to check it out. All of us have been experiencing a tremendous amount of change lately. Over the past four weeks, my life has, has undergone a tremendous amount of change. Four weeks ago, I flew to Israel and had the trip of a lifetime. It was amazing. It was outstanding. But the day I landed was March 12th. If you look at this graph, you can see a big dip in the middle of it. That was March 12th. On that day, the stock market crashed. March Madness was canceled and the NBA uh, postponed the regular season. So all that happened on the day that I landed back in San Francisco after a 15-hour flight. And the next day, March 13th, Jay Inslee closed schools. So all that's to say that in a normal life, under normal circumstances, things change all the time. And, and when we experience a time like this with the coronavirus, we experience even more change than normal. And when this happens, we can experience fear and anxiety. Now, we all need change. If, if life doesn't have enough change in it, we can become bored. But when we have too much change, we can become disoriented. And as I said, we can start to experience anxiety. With all of these changes that we are going through right now, it's hard to know what the future holds. And again, for all of us, this creates anxiety. Because... The coronavirus has introduced so much change into our lives, and because of the fear and anxiety that a lot of us are experiencing, today is the perfect time to walk through Psalm 93. 
Psalm 93 reminds us that the more things change, the more God stays the same. Now, I think that this virus and our response to it is exposing a lot of fears and anxieties and idolatries uh, in our culture. Uh, by the way, if you're having fear and anxiety, it doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian or a bad person. We just live right now in very uncertain times. And again, because of the uncertainty of the time that we are living through, today is a great opportunity to be reminded that God himself does not change, even though life around us changes all the time. We're going to go ahead and read Psalm 93 now. This is my own translation. It's a combination of the New International Version and the English Standard Version. Uh, I blended those to come up with what I think is the best translation of Psalm 93. I'm going to read it, and then as we walk through it, I'm going to put each verse on the overhead. Okay, here we go, Psalm 93. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne was established long ago. You are eternal. The rivers have lifted up, O Lord. The rivers have lifted up their voice. The seas lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunder of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes are very trustworthy. A beautiful holiness adorns your house, O Lord, for endless days. Psalm 93 reminds us that as Christians, our security rests on the truth that even though life changes and the world around us changes, God himself never changes. As Hebrews 13 tells us, the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God does not change. God is self-existent. Nothing created God. God did not create himself. He has always been. God is eternal. The child asks the question, who made God? And the answer is that nobody made God. He is eternal. And not only is God eternal, he is unchanging. And here's what I mean. James chapter 1 verse 17 tells us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. God does not change. And how do we know that God does not change? We know that God does not change because God is perfect. The theologian A.W. Pink tells us God cannot change for the better, for he is already perfect. And being perfect, he cannot change for the worse. The theologian J.I. Packer tells us God exists forever and is always the same. He does not grow old. His life does not wax or wane. He does not gain new powers or lose those he once had. He does not mature or develop. He does not get stronger or weaker or wiser as time goes by. God is perfect. God has always been perfect, and God will always be perfect, and therefore God does not change. This does not mean that God is static and unmoving. The testimony of Scripture is clear that God is full of strong emotions. And Scripture is clear that God is always working to redeem our lives. So God is very active. However, even though the Lord is very active, he himself does not change. Life is like a river, but God himself does not change. And for us, as we walk through this time together, that is extremely comforting for us to remember. God's life does not change. His character does not change. His truth does not change. His ways do not change. And his purposes do not change. God does not change. Well, let's go ahead and walk through Psalm 93 together. As we walk through Psalm 93, verse 1 tells us, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. <coughs> So Psalm 1 begins the psalm by telling us that the Lord reigns. The Lord reigns as the great king over all the earth. And then verse 1 tells us two more very important things about the Lord. First, the Lord is robed in majesty. 
The Lord is robed in majesty. In other words, we cannot look at the Lord without seeing his majesty. Furthermore, and second, the Lord has put on strength as his belt. The Lord has put on strength as his belt. Strength is the belt that holds his robe of majesty in place. The Lord is full of majesty and strength. And because of God's unshakable power, the world itself is firmly established and cannot be moved. As we go on to verse 2, Psalm 93 tells us, Your throne was established long ago. You are eternal. In other words, uh, way back in Genesis chapter 1, God called the world into existence. And ever since he called the world into existence, he has been sitting on the throne as the Lord of all creation. This coronavirus situation has not caused God to get off the throne. God is not off the throne right now and saying, okay, he, humanity, you handle it now. No, uh, right through this situation, each and every moment of each and every day, God is still on the throne, and he has eternal purposes that he is in control of. Okay, he has eternal purposes that he is in control of, uh, and because of these eternal purposes, he's allowing this situation to happen. If God wanted to put a stop to the coronavirus, he could, simply by snapping his fingers. Because he's not, we have to assume that there's good in it for us. God's throne was established long ago. Furthermore, the Lord is eternal. As Revelation 1.8 tells us, The Lord God is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, who is and who was and who is to come. So God is eternal and God is sitting on the throne. Look, we don't know why exactly God is allowing this to happen, but we do know that for the believer, as Romans chapter 8 tells us, God works all things together for good. That doesn't mean there's not going to be real pain or real suffering or real sacrifice that we make in these, in these coming days uh, as we walk through this trial together. But it does mean that God remains in charge of it each and every step of the way. And every day there's an opportunity for the Christian uh, to have good come out of it as we rely on our Lord and Savior uh, for, our, uh, for our guidance and for our strength. So... The Lord is the Alpha and the Omega, and as verse 2 tells us, your throne was established long ago, you are eternal. And then verse 3 tells us, the rivers have lifted up, O Lord, the rivers have lifted up their voice, the seas lift up their roaring. So the first half of Psalm 93 verse 3 talks about rivers. I was recently in Israel the southern half of Israel is extremely hilly and extremely dry. Here I am down uh, near Jericho. We couldn't go into Jericho because uh, of the coronavirus, but we're down at Jericho at sea level, and then in only 20 miles, we go up to Jerusalem, and in those 20 miles, we climb 4,500 feet in elevation. So when the Psalms talk about going up to Jerusalem to worship, that's what they're talking about. The area around Jerusalem is extremely hilly and and deep ravines wind through these hills now these deep ravines uh, start up at the city of jerusalem up at 4500 feet and within 20 miles they drop 4500 feet in elevation so what happens in this part of israel is that when there's a heavy rain these steep valleys that lead away from the city of jerusalem they become uh, overwhelmed with the rain that's falling on the hills up above we have areas like this uh, in our own country in the American Southwest. Well, these steep valleys suddenly fill up with deep, rushing water. And when this happens, you do not want to be caught in a steep valley. So what the first half of this verse is telling us is that uh, even when the, uh, the steep river valleys fill up with, with, uh, with rushing waters, uh, even when it feels like you're in that you're in that dry riverbed that's suddenly being, being overwhelmed with water that's maybe 10, 20, or 30 feet high. Even when it feels like all of life is rushing at you and about to overwhelm you, even then, God is in control. Even when our lives face chaos, God is still in control. Well, verse 3 tells us that God not only rules over the gushing rivers, he also rules over the seas. The seas, the seas lift up their roaring. 
But even when the seas do this, God remains in control. When I was in Israel, our tour guide joked that Jews don't like the water very much. Now, he himself is Jewish. I'll take his word for that. I do know that for people in the ancient Near East, uh, 3,000 years ago when this psalm was written, people back then viewed the water as a symbol of chaos. Here's a humorous picture taken on my trip in Israel just a couple of weeks ago. I say humorous because the Sea of Galilee is pretty calm, and yet there are all these signs all around it saying, Stay out of the water! Don't go in there! Uh, you're going to drown! And, and perhaps these uh, signs illustrate a Jewish fear of the water that lingers on to this day. That, at least, is what our tour guide thought. Well, the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by signs like this one. Most ancient Jews did not like the water, and as I mentioned, water for people in the ancient Near East was a symbol of chaos. This is why in Genesis chapter 1, the first thing that God has to do is to divide and control the waters before he can create life on earth. So for ancient Israel, water represented chaos. So when Psalm 93 tells us that the Lord controls the gushing rivers and the roaring seas, this psalm is telling us that the Lord is in control of all the chaos that we face in every part of our daily lives. And again, as Christians, we can trust that in every part of all this chaos, God has good in it for us. Again, doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant, doesn't mean it's going to be easy, doesn't mean we're going to like it. But God is all wise and all powerful, and he knows how to work even this situation for the good of his children. The things that feel overwhelming to us and out of our control are not out of God's control. He rules over the chaos. In one of the most famous scenes in the New Testament, Jesus calmed the storm. Now this is so cool. When I visited Israel a couple of weeks ago, they actually took us out on the Sea of Galilee. And what was really neat is that we were actually on the Sea of Galilee during a storm. It was so cool. Uh, it was pretty calm when we got out there initially, but after being out there for about 10 minutes, all of a sudden this incredible wind swept over the lake. And it made me think, this is kind of how the disciples must have felt when they were on that boat with Jesus. This is a replica of the type of boat that Jesus and his disciples were in as they crossed that lake. You can see in the back of the boat, underneath the deck, uh, in the back, is a place to store cargo, and apparently it made a good place to take a nap. So we know that Jesus is sleeping. He's not concerned by the storm, uh, but the disciples are. They are making a ruckus. Jesus wakes up from his nap, and then he does something remarkable. He calms the wind and the waves. And of course, this freaks the disciples out. They say, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Wink, wink. Uh, the scriptures are trying to tell us that Jesus is God. Uh, all throughout the Bible, we are taught that Jesus is God. And in this scene in particular, we are shown that the same power that God has to control the watery chaos, Jesus has that same power when he calms the storm. After calming the storm, he rebukes the disciples for their lack of faith. And through it all, the disciples learn that this guy, Jesus, really is in charge of every aspect of life. I mean, if you or I were out on the lake fishing with somebody and they stood up and they rebuked the wind and the waves and suddenly it got calm, I think we would listen to that person and be pretty impressed with their powers. Well, when Jesus calmed the storm, the disciples freaked out and they asked, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And we know the answer. The same God celebrated in Psalm 93 is the same God who came to us in the person of Jesus Christ and calmed the storm. God is all-powerful and all-wise. Because God doesn't change, there will never be a time when God himself is not fully in control. And because God, God doesn't change, there will never be a time when God is not in control of every aspect of our lives. And there will never be a time when he doesn't have a good plan for every aspect of our lives. Psalm 93 reminds us that the Lord rules over the watery chaos, and that takes us to verse 4. Verse 4. Mightier than the thunder of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. 
The Lord rules over all chaos. He is completely in charge of this world that he has made. As verse 1 tells us, the Lord reigns. As the psalm tells us, he reigns even over uh, the flooding river valleys and even, even over the stormy seas. Sometimes life feels like this. Sometimes it feels like we're out in a boat, out on the stormy seas. But even then, as verse 4 reminds us, God remains in control. The Lord reigns over it all. And then in verse 5, the psalm ends by proclaiming, Your statutes are very trustworthy. A beautiful holiness adorns your house, O Lord, for endless days. In other words, God not only uh, in other words, God not only rules over the chaos, God gives us his word, the Bible, to guide us through life's storms. And as I mentioned last Sunday, as we uh, read and study and obey the Bible, uh, as we follow Jesus and, and live in God's ways, even during this difficult time, God uses this trial, just like he uses every trial, uh, to conform us more and more into the image of Jesus. So even as we walk through this difficult time together, the Bible remains our rule for faith and life. The Bible still teaches us how to be saved, and the Bible still teaches us how we can live faithfully. So even as we suffer from these trials, as Christians, we are called on to remember that God is sovereign, he's not changing, he's still on the throne, and he still has a good plan for his people. And so in closing, remember this. The more things change, the more God stays the same. The Lord reigns. God is full of strength. The Lord holds us in the palm of his hands. God is eternal and unchanging. The Lord rules over the chaos. God's word remains a reliable and comforting guide for life. And as we faithfully walk through this trial, the Lord will use this time to make us more and more look like him. Well, I hope you've been encouraged by our time together in Psalm 93. God bless, and I will talk to you soon.